Hello everyone, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to finish up our lecture on solutions. We've made it to our final objective, which discusses colligative properties. Colligative properties are physical properties of solutions that depend on the number of solute particles in a given amount of solvent and not on the nature of the solute particles. These properties arise because solute particles interfere with the interactions between solvent molecules. The key colligative properties include vapor pressure lowering, freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, and osmotic pressure. Now we're going to start with discussing vapor pressure lowering and defining Raoult's law. Raoult's law describes the vapor pressure lowering of a solvent when a non-volatile solute is dissolved in it. According to Raoult's law, the vapor pressure of the solvent in a solution is directly proportional to the mole fraction of the solvent. This law implies that the addition of a solute reduces the vapor pressure of the solvent because the solute particles occupy some of the surface area thereby reducing the number of solvent molecules that can escape into the vapor phase. Now, to determine the vapor pressure of a solution, we're going to consider two cases. The first case deals with a non-volatile solute in a volatile solvent, and the second case deals with a solution with two volatile components. Now, in the first case, when a non-volatile solute is dissolved in a volatile solvent, the vapor pressure of the solution is solely due to the volatile solvent. The non-volatile solute, it does not contribute to the vapor pressure because it doesn't evaporate. Therefore, the vapor pressure of the solution is going to be determined by the vapor pressure of the solvent component alone. And we can write this expression in the following way. Our vapor pressure of solution is equal to Xa Pa0. Here, Xa is the mole fraction of the solvent in the solution, and Pa0 is the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. This equation shows that the vapor pressure of the solution is directly proportional to the mole fraction of the solvent. As the concentration of the non-volatile solute increases, the vapor pressure of the solution decreases. Now, the second scenario involves a solution where both components are volatile. So in this case, the total vapor pressure of the solution is going to be the sum of the partial vapor pressures of each component. So according to Raoult's law, the vapor pressure of each component in the solution is proportional to its mole fraction and its vapor pressure when pure. So for a two volatile system here, our total vapor pressure of the solution is just going to be, again, the sum of the partial vapor pressures of each component. So the partial pressure of component A and B. And we can expand that based off, off of our definition for that from case one. So PA plus PB is just equal to XA PA naught. Again, where XA is going to be the mole fraction of the solvent in the solution, and PA naught is the vapor pressure of the pure solvent dealing with component A. And then same goes with XB PB naught. XB is the mole fraction of component B, and PB0 is the vapor pressure of the pure component B. This equation assumes that the solution behaves ideally, meaning the intermolecular forces between unlike molecules A and B are similar to those between like molecules A and A and B and B. Now, in relation to this, we can also talk about an ideal solution. An ideal solution is one that obeys Raoult's law across the entire range of compositions. So that is demonstrated in this figure here. In an ideal solution, the intermolecular interactions between different components are similar, resulting in no significant changes in enthalpy or volume upon mixing. 
However, it's important to note that not all solutions are ideal. Non-ideal solutions exhibit deviations from Raoul's law, which can be either positive or negative. Positive deviation occurs when the vapor pressure of the solution is higher than predicted by Raoul's law. This typically happens when the intermolecular forces between the different components A and B are weaker than those within the pure components A and A and B and B. As a result, the components are more likely to escape into the vapor phase, increasing the vapor pressure. Then we can discuss negative deviations. Negative deviations occur when the vapor pressure of the solution is lower than expected. And this happens when the intermolecular forces between different components are stronger than those within the pure components, making it harder for the molecules to escape into the vapor phase, thereby lowering the vapor pressure. Understanding these two cases and the concept of ideal versus non-ideal solutions is really crucial for predicting the behavior of solutions in various chemical processes. And this lowering of vapor pressure, it has significant effects on other colligative properties such as boiling point elevation and freezing point depression, which we're going to get into next. Boiling point elevation occurs when a non-volatile solute is added to a solvent, raising the boiling point of the solution relative to that of the pure solvent. This happens because the presence of solute particles lowers the solvent's vapor pressure, requiring a higher temperature to reach the vapor pressure necessary for boiling. Now the boiling point elevation can be calculated using this equation, where delta Tb is the change in boiling point. Kb is the boiling point elevation constant. It's unique for each solvent. And M is the concentration of the solution expressed in molality. In addition, you see this I. This is the Van Hoff factor, and it tells us the number of particles into which a solute dissociates or ionizes in solution. Then we have freezing point depression. This occurs when a non-volatile solute is added to a solvent, lowering the freezing point of the solution relative to that of the pure solvent. This happens because the solute particles are gonna interfere with the formation of the solid structure of the solvent, and that's gonna require a lower temperature to achieve the phase transition. Now, the freezing point depression can be calculated using this equation right here, where delta Tf is the change in freezing point, Kf is the freezing point depression constant. This is also unique for each solvent. M is the concentration of the solution expressed in molality, and I, again, is the Van Hoff factor. It tells us the number of particles into which a solute dissociates or ionizes in solution. Last, we have osmotic pressure. This is the pressure required to prevent the flow of solvent molecules through a semi-permeable membrane from a region of lower solute concentration to a region of higher solute concentration. Osmosis occurs because solvent molecules naturally move to equalize solute concentrations on both sides of the membrane. The osmotic pressure of a solution, it can be calculated using this equation where M is molarity, R is our gas constant, T is temperature, and I is our Van Hoff factor. Now, osmotic pressure is particularly important in biological systems because it helps regulate the flow of water and the flow of nutrients in and out of the cell. With that being said, let's go ahead and hop into a couple of practice problems. Actually, really quickly before we do that problem, I just want to note that temperature is in Kelvin and R, our ideal gas constant, you want to use 0 0.08206 liters times atmosphere over moles times Kelvin so that the units cancel out appropriately to give you osmotic pressure.
Now let's do this example. This example says a solution was prepared by mixing 0 0.200 moles of acetone with 0 0.600 moles of ethyl acetate. At 30 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of pure acetone is 285 torr, and the vapor pressure of pure ethyl acetate is 118 torr. What is the vapor pressure of the solution at 30 degrees Celsius? We're also given the molecular formula for acetone and for ethyl acetate. Now, acetone and ethyl acetate are both volatile. And the reason we know this to be true is that they both have a vapor pressure in their pure states. Keeping that in mind, let's go ahead and think about how we want to attempt this problem. To figure out the total vapor pressure of the solution, it's going to be the vapor pressure of acetone plus the vapor pressure of ethyl acetate. So we can write that P solution is equal to the pressure of acetone plus, plus the pressure of ethyl acetate. Now, Raoul's law here can be applied to both volatile components so that we can expand each of these terms. The vapor pressure of acetone is going to be equal to X acetone. This is the mole fraction of acetone multiplied by the pressure of acetone in its pure state. Similarly, we can do the same thing for the vapor pressure of ethyl acetate. It's going to be equal to the mole fraction of ethyl acetate multiplied by the vapor pressure of pure ethyl acetate. That way we can rewrite our equation. P solution is equal to XAC PAC naught plus XEA PEA naught. Now what is mole fraction. This is something we discussed in this chapter. Mole fraction is going to be equal to the component, the mole of our component of interest. So for acetone, it's going to be the moles of acetone divided by the total number of moles. Our total number of moles is going to be the moles of acetone plus the moles of ethyl acetate. So we could plug this in here for X acetone. We can do the same thing for ethyl acetate. The mole fraction of ethyl acetate is going to be the moles of ethyl acetate over the total number of moles. Now that we understand all the components of this equation that's going to be used to calculate the total vapor pressure of the solution, we can go ahead and start to plug in numbers. So P solution is going to be equal to the mole fraction of acetone. Now we know that our moles of acetone is 0 0.200. And the total number of moles is going to be the moles of acetone, which is 0 0.2, plus the number of moles of ethyl acetate, which is 0 0.6. And that's going to be multiplied by the vapor pressure of pure acetone, which we're given in the problem. It's equal to 285 torr. This is going to be summed up with... The next part, we're going to write the mole fraction of ethyl acetate. This is going to be the moles of ethyl acetate, which is 0 0.600, divided by the total number of moles, which is 0 0.2 plus 0 0.6. And then that's going to be multiplied by the pure, the vapor pressure of pure ethyl acetate. Also given to us in the problem, it's equal to 118 torr. Then if we plug this into a calculator, we're going to get the total vapor pressure of the solution. And it is going to be equal to 160 torr. Wonderful. That's how you solve this problem. Let's go ahead and tackle the next two. This problem says 400 grams of aluminum chloride is dissolved in 1.5 liters of water at room temperature. And here we're given the Kb value. This is the boiling point elevation constant. Then we're asked, how much does the boiling point increase after adding the aluminum chloride? 
Now, to solve this problem, we're going to have to use our boiling point elevation equation, which says delta Tb, this is the change in boiling point, is equal to I kbm. Now here, I is the Van Hoff factor, which corresponds to the number of particles into which a compound dissociates in solution. For aluminum chloride, this is going to dissociate into one aluminum cation and three chloride anions. So our I value is going to be one plus three, which is equal to four. Kb here, this is our boiling point elevation constant, and we're given that in the problem. M is molality, and we're going to have to calculate that. We're not given that directly in the problem. Now, molality is equal to the number of moles of solute divided by the mass of the solvent in kilograms. Now, let's start with the denominator here. We're given information about our solvent. Our solvent is water, and we have 1.5 liters of water. Now, we want to convert that to mass of solvent in kilograms. 1.5 liters is actually equal to 1.5 kilograms. And this equivalence between 1.5 liters and 1.5 kilograms occurs because of the density of water. The density of water is one gram per milliliter, which is equal to one kilogram per liter. So we're able to write that 1.5 liters is equal to 1.5 kilograms. Now, what about the numerator? Number of moles of solute. We're given the mass of our solute, 400 grams, of aluminum chloride. We need to convert this to moles, and we can do this by using molar mass. One mole of aluminum chloride is equal to 133.5 grams of aluminum chloride. And when we calculate this, we'll get approximately three moles of aluminum chloride. So now we have the number of moles of solute, and we have the mass of our solvent in kilograms, we can go ahead and plug this in. Three moles of aluminum chloride divided by 1.5 kilograms. This gives us a molality of two. Now we have all the variables we need to plug back into our boiling point elevation equation and calculate our final answer. This is going to be four, multiplied by 0 0.512, and that's going to be multiplied by our molality, which is equal to 2. If we plug this into a calculator, our final answer is 4.1 Kelvin. So how much does the boiling point increase after adding aluminum chloride? It's going to increase by about 4.1 Kelvin. Fantastic. Now let's answer this second one, very much related to this first problem we did, but it's asking for something slightly different. It says 400 grams of aluminum chloride is dissolved in 1.5 liters of water at room temperature. And here we're given the KF value. This is the freezing point depression constant. And we're asked, what's the new freezing point of this solution? Now to answer this problem, we're going to be using our freezing point depression equation, which says that the change in freezing point is equal to I kf multiplied by m. I is our Van Hoff factor. We're dealing with the same system, so it is still 4. Kf is our freezing point depression constant. We're given that in the problem. And then for molality, again, we're dealing with the same system. Same mass of solute, same mass of solvent in kilograms, so same molality. It is going to be equal to 2. And we can go ahead and calculate now the freezing point depression. This is going to be 4 multiplied by 1.86 multiplied by 2, and what we're going to get is 14.9 Kelvin. Now, we haven't answered the problem yet. We're asked, What's the new freezing point of this solution? The normal freezing point of water is at 273 Kelvin. The freezing point is going to be depressed or decreased by about 14.9 Kelvin. 
And so the new freezing point is going to be 273 minus 14.9 Kelvin. And this is going to give us a final temperature of 258 Kelvin approximately. So this is our new freezing point for this solution. Wonderful. Let's go ahead and move on into our next topic. Here we're going to discuss how we're going to use colligative properties to determine molar mass. In order to determine molar mass from your colligative properties, we need to follow four main steps. The first step is to determine the magnitude of the colligative properties. Colligative properties include vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure. And these properties are directly related to the concentration of the solute in the solution. The next step is to then use the magnitude of the colligative properties to determine the concentration of the solution. So again, once you've measured the magnitude of the colligative property, we can then calculate the concentration of the solution. Each colligative property is associated with a specific equation that relates the measured change to the concentration of the solute in the solution. So here's how we can determine the concentration for each property. For vapor pressure lowering, you can calculate the mole fraction of the solvent. So you can rearrange your equation for the vapor pressure of the solution to solve for mole fraction, which in turn is going to allow you to determine the mole fraction of the solute and then finally the concentration. For boiling point elevation, you want to rearrange your equation to solve for molality, which is a measure of the concentration in moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. For freezing point depression, this is very similar to boiling point elevation. You can calculate the molality by rearranging the equation. And then finally, for osmotic pressure, you want to rearrange this equation to solve for molarity. And molarity is the concentration of the solution in moles per liter. Then we can move into our third step. Here you want to use the concentration to determine the number of moles of the unknown solute. So once you have the concentration of the solution, you can use it to find the number of moles of the unknown solute. So depending on the form of the concentration, you're going to have to do a couple of different things. If you're working with mole fraction and you want to solve for the number of moles of the unknown solute, then you want to rearrange this equation to solve for Na. If you have molality and you want to solve for the number of moles of the unknown solute, then again, you want to rearrange this expression to solve for that. It's going to be equal to the mass of the solvent in kilograms multiplied by molality. That will give you the number of moles of the unknown solute. Then finally, if you have molarity, then you want to rearrange to solve for the number of moles of the unknown solute, and that's going to be equal to molarity multiplied by the volume of the solution. And then as a last and final step to determine the molar mass of the unknown solute, you're going to use the definition of molar mass, which is the mass of the solute divided by the number of moles of the solute. Let's go ahead and put this into effect by tackling a practice problem. This problem says a solution was prepared by dissolving one gram of an unknown non-electrolyte in 50 grams of carbon tetrachloride. The freezing point of the solution was found to be negative 28.4 degrees Celsius. What is the molar mass of this unknown solute? We're also given the freezing point of pure carbon tetrachloride. It's equal to negative 22.6 degrees Celsius. And we're given the freezing point depression constant for carbon tetrachloride. Now here, we're going to use our colligative properties to determine molar mass. So we're going to follow the four steps we just discussed. 
the first step is to determine the magnitude of the colligative effect. In this case, that means we need to find the amount by which the freezing point went down. So we're trying to calculate delta Tf. Now, one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this practice problem is because I wanted to talk about what this freezing point depression and boiling point elevation values really stand for. What does this delta Tf mean? And in the same manner, what does delta Tb really mean? In this case, delta actually does not mean final minus initial. Instead, it refers to the difference between the freezing or the boiling point of the pure solvent and the freezing or boiling point of the solution. So here for this problem, we want to calculate delta Tf. And delta Tf is going to be the freezing point of the pure solvent minus the freezing point of the solution. And the same idea extends to delta Tb. So please keep this in mind. This case is the only case you'll see in this course where delta doesn't mean final minus initial. So here to calculate delta Tf, it's going to be equal to negative 22.6 degrees Celsius minus negative 28.4 degrees Celsius. And we get 5.8 degrees Celsius. Now we can move into our second step. Here we want to use the magnitude of the colligative effect to determine the concentration of the solution. So let's write our expression for delta Tf. This is equal to I Kfm. Now I here is going to be 1 because we're dealing with a non electrolyte, so it's not going to dissociate into ions in solution, therefore I equals 1. What we want to do here is just rearrange this equation to solve for M, considering that I is 1, so we can essentially just omit it here. So then, when we rearrange this equation, we have M is equal to delta Tf divided by Kf. And we just calculated delta Tf. We're given the freezing point depression constant. We can go ahead and plug these values in. It's going to be 5.8 degrees Celsius divided by 29.9 degrees Celsius per molality. This is going to give us a molality that is equal to 0 0.194. This is equal to moles per kilogram. Now we can move into our third step. Now that we know the concentration of the solution, we want to use the definition of the concentration term to determine the number of moles of solute. So the definition for molality is moles of solute divided by the mass of solvent in kilograms. Now, we can rearrange this equation to solve for the number of moles of solute. This is unknown to us, so we can rearrange it to solve for it. It's going to be equal to molality multiplied by the mass of the solvent in kilograms. Now, we know the molality. It's going to be equal to 0 0.194 moles per kilogram. Let's write that down. And then we want to multiply it by the mass of the solvent. We're told we have 50 grams. We want to convert this to kilograms so that our units of kilograms cancels out and we get our final answer in moles. 50 grams is equal to 0 0.05 kilograms. And when we multiply, 0 0.194 by 0 0.05, we're going to get 0 0.00970 moles. Now we can move into our fourth and final step. In our fourth and final step, we're going to use the mass of the unknown along with the number of moles of the unknown from this step that we just calculated, step three, to calculate the molar mass. Remember, molar mass is mass divided by moles. Our mass of the unknown is one gram. 
and we just determined that our moles is 0 0.00970 moles. And this gives us a molar mass of 103 grams per mole. There we have it. We have calculated the molar mass. And that's how we solve this problem. And with that, we've actually completed everything that we wanted to cover in this chapter. I really hope this was helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns, if you need any clarification in regards to anything we talked about, please reach out. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.